thank you very much uh, for being here on this rainy morning uh, to talk uh, fittingly about climate change. Um, and I would like to thank those of you who were able to make it last night as well. Uh, we had a really, really pleasant launch of uh, the event today at the Embassy of Canada, where we were uh, treated to some very interesting and provocative interventions to launch our day-long detailed conversation about some of the challenges and opportunities associated with climate change. Um, my name is Jennifer Lowton, and I'm Canada's permanent representative to the Organization of American States. It's a tremendous honor to play that role in this region, uh, so full of challenges and so full of opportunities. I'm extremely pleased uh, today to be joined by all of you uh, here participating with us, a number of ambassadors and senior representatives, members of legislatures from around the region. Uh, this is exactly the crowd that we should have together to discuss this issue, which has both implementation implications as well as high-level policy uh, implementation implications. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Sec Executive Secretary of Integral Development, Kim Osborne. She'll be playing a very special role today, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, for now, to open, off our, open our event for today, we're joined by Assistant Secretary General Nestor Mendez. We'll hear from him in a moment. And Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, Ambassador Patricia Fuller. Uh, very quickly, before I turn the floor over to Nestor for some opening comments, I would just like to say a word about the format. So we will have a series of panels uh, that will be moderated who, by moderators who will have control of those events, and most importantly, will be supported by a rapporteur. And at the end of each session, we'll hear comments from the rapporteur. The idea there is to help to drill down and really pull some concrete outcomes out of this process. So please keep in mind in your interventions, we're looking to drill down to what can be done and to some concrete responses, and there will be a rapporteur to capture them. At the end of the day, uh, the Executive Secretary of Integral Development will provide an overview of the event, of the day's conversations, which I think will be a really important outcome of the session. I'd also like to point out that uh, we're going to be working hard all day, so we'll give you a couple of breaks. There'll be a break in the middle and then a lunch break, at which time I would encourage you to just wander out onto the eighth floor and visit the new Canadian Art Gallery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last year was Canada's 150th anniversary, and as part of our celebration, Canada made a donation of 150 works of art, and I am very, very honoured that the OAS decided to open this dedicated gallery on the eighth floor of this building. So please go out, enjoy yourselves, have a little break, enjoy the art, and when you do, please remember that Matteo Barney was the genius behind that donation, and I'd like to thank him for everything he did for that and everything he and Paige from our mission did to put this event together today. So with no further ado, it's my tremendous pleasure and honor to introduce Ambassador Nestor Mendez, uh, exec or, sorry, pardon me, Assistant Secretary General of the OAS. Nestor, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, Her Excellency Patricia Fuller, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, distinguished Ambassador Lawton, a good friend of a long time, not an old friend, but a friend of a long time. Ms. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary for Integral Development, Distinguished Ambassadors. When I walked in this morning, um, I saw one of uh, my Canadian colleagues who have known around for a while, and I was asking her, so you brought this fantastic weather from Canada? <laughs> and she's oh, like, you know, <laughs> think about it, it could have been snow. So <laughs> we count our blessings, it's too early for that. Uh, I wish to start by congratulating the leadership of Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Permanent Mission of Canada for teaming up with the OS Department of Sustainable Development to organize this important and timely regional workshop. Global climate change is real and it poses the gravest threat to the security, human development and the livelihoods of the people of our hemisphere. Today's event is timely because it follows closely on the heels of a very special report issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a few weeks ago. This report is deeply worrying to me, as it should be to all of us. As I am sure, everyone in this room is concerned about what's going on with this important topic. The first observation I had about the report is that it is in line with the position that was adopted by the Alliance of, of Small Island States, including those in the Caribbean, in the run-up to the Conference of Parties to the Climate Change Convention held in Paris in December 2015. Many of you would remember 
that the EOSIS argued strenuously for global warming to be limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius instead of the target of below 2 degrees Celsius, which is contained in the Paris Agreement. According to the special report, we are already seeing the consequences of a 1 degree Celsius change of global warming through more extreme weather, rising sea levels, and diminishing Arctic sea ice, among other very visible changes. Very importantly, the report highlights a number of climate change impacts that could be avoided if global warming were limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius as opposed to 2% 2, 2 degrees Celsius or more. For example, the report notes that if global warming is kept at below 1.5 degrees Celsius instead of 2, by 2000, the rise in global the rise in global sea levels would be 10 centimeters lower. The likelihood of an Arctic Ocean free of sea ice in summer months would be once per century compared with at least once per decade. And coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90 percent compared with a total disappearance at 2 degrees Celsius. The Americas is one of the regions at highest risk of sea level rise as most of our cities are coastal cities and many countries are low-lying. I come from Belize, as you all know, one of these very low-lying countries that will be seriously impacted by 2 degrees Celsius warming scenario. As a matter of fact, even today, if you visit Belize on a day when the high tide comes in, it, has, it, it now reaches levels beyond anything anybody remembers before now. The likelihood that Belize's coastline may be inundated by sea level rise of as much as 15 centimeters and that its coral reefs, you may recall that we have the second longest coral reef in the world, may be totally lost, is frightening. This is not the kind of future we should want to leave for our children and the future generations in the Americas. Today, this is one of the most pressing issues of our times, and we must take firm action immediately, as the special report of the IPCC warns. Indeed, the incremental cost of the adverse impacts of climate change on countries in our hemisphere over the next 50 years is really significant. For the Caribbean alone, this damage is estimated at an average of 1.9 billion US dollars per year. The impacts of climate change that we have already seen and those that we anticipate, such as more intense hurricanes, changes in rainfall patterns and sea level rise, all increase the region's risk and threaten to further set back its economic and social development. A colossal effort is required to build the capacity of local and national governments to mainstream climate action and disaster risk management in development planning and in decision making. Particular attention must be given to building the capacity of countries to design and manage comprehensive early warning systems that assist in the prediction of and response to slow and rapid onset disasters. Attention should also be focused on internal and external policy failures that can weaken the vulnerability and resilience of countries to disasters. Mitigating the factors that cause climate change and building resilience to its impacts is beyond the capacity of any one country and therefore should best be approached within a hemispheric framework that promotes sustained collaboration among OS member states, more particularly in areas such as policy dialogue, research on climatics, climate science, technology transfers, and public education and awareness. Effective climate action must involve sustained investment in vulnerability reduction. Governments and their development partners will need to allocate more significantly more resources to address the root causes of vulnerability, such as rapid urbanization, high poverty levels, weak institutions, inadequate land use planning and environmental management, 
and weak enforcement of building standards. And while we are addressing these root causes of vulnerability, we should not lose sight of the importance of conflict resolution and conflict management techniques and strategies for dealing with competitive issues over land and water, such as land use planning, environmental impact assessment, and risk assessment. From the perspective of the OAS, the challenges of climate change require a holistic approach. We believe that risk reduction should be an integral component of strategic development programming and of sound governance that ensures participation of government institutions, civil society organizations, and the private sector. We must also continue advocating partnerships and alliances within and between societies to more effectively coordinate our efforts to mobilize resources and to implement recovery and reconstruction programs. I want to mention something very, very specific. It's not enough for our governments to take these measures. It is not enough for academia to be involved. We need to get our young people, our millennials, sold, convinced to become advocates that it is important to take decisive action to reverse and to constrain what we're seeing happening with climate change. Two years ago, OS member states adopted the Inter-American Programs for Sustainable Development, PIDS, which calls on the General Secretariat to help them to speed up the implementation of the Climate Change Convention and the Paris Agreement. The PIDS treats climate change as a cross-cutting issue and encourages an integrated approach to climate change mitigation and adaptation. In my view, the Council for Integral Development, better known as CIDI, and meetings of ministers and high-level authorities for sustainable development cooperation, respectively, could serve as hemispheric fora through which a regional partnership on climate change could be built. Through these organs, climate action in the Americas can be further institutionalized as it includes all inter-American organizations, all relevant regional intergovernmental organizations, especially those such as the Central American Integration System, the Caribbean Community, the Andean, the Andean Community, and the Association of Caribbean States all relevant UN system agencies, development banks, international financial institutions, and multilateral bilateral cooperation agencies, along with universities and other academic institutions, all of which complete the regional platform in the Americas, which we have to activate. Further, there is a need for increased support and assistance to be given to the small and vulnerable economies in the Caribbean and Central America to manage climate-related risks in, in, in their societies. I thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I hope that at the end of the day, the conclusions that were referred to by the distinguished ambassador of Canada will be far-reaching and that we can actually move on with our implementation. Thank you. Nestor, thank you so much. Uh, what a great way to launch our conversations today. That was a really comprehensive look at the range of institutions in the inter-American system that have a role to play. Uh, and I think, too, a really good summary of some of the challenges, uh, particular to the Americas and the Caribbean. Uh, it's important to understand the challenges, but to address them, we need leadership. Um, the role that you and the OES have played have been part of that. And Canada is very proud to, to uh, assist in that role as well. And one of the things that Canada has done to play leadership role is by naming an ambassador for climate change. Um, and Patricia Fuller, who has played that role since 2017, is out there building new partnerships and trying to motivate innovative thinking and uh, step outside of the box a little bit and, and move this conversation forward. I'm very pleased that she's here to join us this morning. And I'd like now to turn the floor over to Ambassador Patricia Fuller. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you so much for everything you and your mission have done to partner with Environment and Clim Climate Change Canada to organize this workshop today. And 
thank you, Assistant Secretary General, for the support from the OIS in, in making this all happen. So good morning to all of you, ambassadors, President Figueres, and others who are here today. Buenos dias. Uh, es un placer ver tanta, tantos países aquí esta mañana. Uh, and uh, um, as uh, Jennifer said, my role as ambassador for climate change is uh, to engage internationally and build partnerships that advance action on climate change. And when we think about partnerships, this hemisphere is always first in our minds. So very pleased to, to be here this morning. Uh, the Assistant Secretary General has already done a, a masterful job in outlining the contents of the recent IPCC report. So that's a very good starting point for our discussions today. Uh, and I would only add one thing to, to uh, his uh, outline of what that report had to say, and that is the timeline that it outlines in terms of uh, uh, how quickly we need to act to be able to have a, a possibility to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees. And what the report said on that point is that global emissions have to be cut nearly in half by 2030, in other words, 12 years from now. So that really does underline the urgency of accelerating action to reduce emissions. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the impacts of climate change are certainly, as the report said, already in evidence. They are in Canada as well. We had a summer of more extreme forest fires and extreme heat waves uh, than we have had ever, uh, and warming in the Arctic that is two to three times the global uh, temperature average. But we know that the impacts of climate change, change that are being felt by, by others in this hemisphere, particularly in the Caribbean, are even more acute and that more frequent and more damaging hurricanes in particular are threatening national livelihoods. So that is why Canada placed the challenges of building resilience of vulnerable coastal communities at the heart of our G7 presidency. And in June, at the Charlevoix G7 Leaders Summit, G7 members agreed to the Charlevoix Blueprint on Healthy Oceans, Seas, and Resilient Coastal Communities. And this included commitments to support innovative financing for coastal resilience, as well as better adaptation planning, emergency preparedness, and recovery. We also launched the Oceans Plastics Charter. So in the context of the IPCC report, I think it's fair to say forward momentum for the Paris Agreement is even more vital. And that is why the upcoming COP24 is so important. Uh, we need to reach agreement at COP24 on the Paris Work Program, as it's referred to, or the Paris Rulebook, which is to provide guidance for the implementation of the agreement. And we need to adopt implementation guidance that promotes universal ambition, ambition of the level that's required, as well as transparency. And, and this is critical for sustaining the positive momentum of the Paris Agreement. It's also important for the mechanism built into the Paris Agreement, which is to enhance ambition over time. Latin America and the Caribbean are playing a very important role in these discussions. And indeed, I am pleased to be traveling onward from uh, here to uh, Colombia next week, where the Colombian government is uh, presiding the ILAC group, which is the negotiating bloc, which unifies uh, Latin American countries and the Caribbean countries in the context of climate change negotiations. For our part, Canada is fully committed to meeting its Paris commitment. We're moving ahead at full speed with the implementation of our pan-Canadian framework for clean growth and climate change. We're putting a price on carbon, and we're also putting in place regulations and incentives to reduce emissions across the full range of sectors of our economy. And as we move ahead with this plan, we're conscious also that there is a significant opportunity here in the transition to a low-carbon economy. 
It has been estimated that reaching the Paris goals will result in an economic gain of 25 trillion US dollars globally. So against this background, I'd like to focus uh, the remainder of my remarks on how Canada is helping developing countries to reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. And in particular, to talk about the special initiatives we're implementing to support recovery and resilience in the Caribbean. As part of the commitment of developed countries to mobilize $100 billion in annual financing by 2020, Canada is delivering $2.65 billion by 2020 to help developing countries build resilience against climate change, as well as to achieve sustained emissions reductions. We have made advancing gender equality a key goal of this assistance, as climate action is indeed more effective when men and women participate equally in solutions. A significant portion of these funds are being used to mobilize much larger amounts of private sector investment. And this funding builds on Canada's previous investments that have established a track record of innovative approaches for mobilizing private sector financing. Canadian facilities at the multilateral development banks, including the Inter-American Development Bank, of course, and the IFC, are supporting truly transformational climate action in developing countries on mitigation and adaptation to, to climate change. For example, in uh, uh, El Salvador, the Canadian facility at the IDB supported the first utility-scale so solar voltaic project. Uh, also in Panama, and indeed in three other countries in the region, the first utility-scale solar, solar projects. Another example in Peru at the Universidad San Ignacio de Loyola, we have supported a low carbon energy efficient building design that uh, uh, was a project that mobilized $54 million in private sector investment. In the Caribbean, Canada pledged $100 million towards Caribbean reconstruction and resilience following the devastating hurricane season of last year. And earlier this year, during the April 2018 Summit of the Americas, Prime Minister Trudeau announced an additional 25.5 million towards climate and economic resilience efforts in the Caribbean. And as part of this pledge, we're providing funding through the Caribbean Development Bank for, again, another example, rebuilding five primary schools in Dominica. Uh, we're also helping the Caribbean Disaster Emer Emergency Management Agency strengthen the region's capacity to prepare for and respond to disasters. Uh, we're pleased to be the largest contributor to the Caribbean Development Bank's Special Development Fund. Uh, and we have also established a fund at the CDB to support the energy sector. Uh, so Anguilla, for example, is using this fund to conduct energy audits in public facilities. We have recognized uh, uh, the challenge that the Caribbean is facing in accessing the numerous climate finance funds which have been put in place globally, the Green Climate Fund and other funds. Uh, so we last month announced a facility that is being put into place at the World Bank, which is intended to provide assistance, this is technical assistance, to countries in the Caribbean in order to identify uh, mobilize and access uh, funding. This is the, the new Canada-Caribbean Resilience Facility at the World Bank. So to conclude, Canada is a committed partner with Latin America and the Caribbean in our collective efforts to address climate change and build resilience. The IPCC report has identified the urgency of this topic and we hope that the discussions that take place here today will support our collective capacity to accelerate climate change action. So I'm looking very much forward to the discussions and thank you. Gracias por su atención. Thanks very much, Patricia. I took note of a, a number of things in your presentation and let me assure the room that copies of Nestor's comments as well as uh, Ambassador Fuller's will be made available uh, to all of you. Um, it sounds like this is going to take a collective effort of all of us working together. Governments, academics, the private sector, industry, civil society. The other thing I took note of though is urgency. Uh, it's now quarter to ten. 
Um, so what I'd like to do now is invite the moderator of our first panel to come forward, uh, Gil Roshinsky, who is Canada's Executive Director at the Inter-American Development Bank. He will introduce our first two panelists, who I would invite now to come and join the head table. And I'll thank at this time Nestor Mendes for his participation, Ambassador Fuller. I hope, uh, Nestor, you'll be with us as much of the morning as you can, and I know, Ambassador Fuller, that you'll be here as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our next panel. Thank you very much. I've uh, just been asked to remind the room that this event is being webcast. I'm going to hold this email address up so that those who are, and hopefully the camera can zero in on that. This is the email address that we would invite those participating online to send questions to. Is this, is this good? Can you see that? Which will be uh, transmitted to the moderators of the panel. So I'm clearly in the way. I'll move off now. And all set. Okay. Bueno, muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Uh, bonjour a tous et à toutes. Uh, bon dia. Good morning. Um, my name is Guillermo Roshinsky. I am the Executive Director for Canada at the Inter-American Development Bank. And it is my honor to be the moderator of this first panel uh, this morning, which will look at the issue of the impact of climate change on the Americas. As had been said this morning, the, uh, the Americas, regrettably, is probably the region of the world that is most impacted by climate phenomenon. And working as I do right now at uh, a multilateral financial institution like the IADB, it is striking that uh, the IADB has made a commitment to the region that by 2020, fully one third of all of the financing that it provides to member states uh, in the region is going to be directed at climate sensitive activity, which I think underlines the nature of the challenge uh, that is faced in the region. We have two uh, excellent speakers uh, who will talk about issues associated with climate impacts. Uh, first, we have uh, Ms. Fiona Warren, who is the Senior Science Advisor for Climate Change and Adaptation at the Department of Natural Resources at the Government of Canada and she will speak to the issues of the links between climate change and extreme weather events. And then we will have uh, Dr. Patricia Beirmeier Hensano, adjunct professor for the Center of Latin American Studies. Oh, okay, sorry. We have uh, Patricia Caporasso, uh, who is the managing director for food uh, and uh, for development, and they will speak to the issue of climate impacts. Please, Dr. Ford, you have the floor. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I'm very honored to be speaking at this timely and important event. Before I get into my presentation, just a little bit of background about me. I've been working on the issue of climate change impacts and adaptation for more than 15 years now. I've been focusing on how Canada primarily will be impacted by climate change and the different ways that we can adapt to reduce the risk. So throughout my career, I've been asked often by my family and friends, uh, is your work depressing? <laughs> and my answer to date has generally been no, because I've been inspired by the work that's going on in Canada. It's such a broad topic. I learn new things constantly, and the field has evolved so quickly. However, recently, over the last few weeks or so, as I've been working on this presentation, which gave me a chance to really dive into the issue of climate change and extreme events, combined with the release of the IPCC 1.5 degree report, which we've heard about already this morning, and I'm sure we'll hear about more today, and combined on the third level with the political climate and things that are going on globally, I do feel scared. I feel, honestly, I feel scared. I feel scared for our collective future. I feel scared for my children's future. But I think the big takeaway message is that we really need to get our act together. So we need to get our act together at all levels, as a global community, at the national, subnational levels, cities, and even at the individual level. And I think there is hope. 
definitely hope we have time, not a lot, but there's an urgency to act now on both adaptation, which is what I've been working on for years, but also on the mitigation side. So on that note, I would like to say thank you to the organizers specifically for bringing us together today, because I think this is a really, um, it's a great step in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So here is my outline for today. I was asked to talk about the link between climate change and extreme weather events. So I will talk a little bit about the trends that we've seen. I'll go into a bit more detail. I only have 10 minutes for my presentation, so it'll be a high level look at three types of events. I've chosen heat waves, hurricanes, and wildfire. I'll talk a little bit about what we expect in the future in terms of the projections. Also drawing from the IPCC report, the current one, as well as many of the past reports. And then I could not end without talking about ways to reduce the risks. And I know that many other talks today will be talking about that, but in good conscience, I could not end my presentation on such a negative note. Thank you. I think you have to click well, yeah. So for those of us that watch the news, it seems like extreme events are increasing. These are just examples of some of the headlines that we pulled out of the news over the past just four months. And these are articles only focused on the US and Canada. So we are constantly hearing that uh, extreme events are happening. There's hurricanes, heat waves, um, droughts, floods, constantly hearing about them. And we are seeing more often now, especially in Canada, the media making the link between these events and climate change. So they appear to be increasing. So if we go to the next slide, thanks. I pulled up this graph, which is quite easy to follow to see the actual numbers. So if you look at this graph, I think a few takeaway points is that we are seeing an increasing global trend in natural disasters. This is since 1980, so the record is fairly solid. And I do want to point out that here we're talking about disasters. So to differentiate a disaster from an extreme event, a disaster is something that has impact. So it either has economic impacts or impacts on human health or human life. So we do, oops, no, <laughs> we see an increasing trend. So in the 1980s, there were about 200 to 300 events or disasters per year. Whereas in our current decade, we're looking at between 500 and 700. And an important point to notice is that the economic losses tend to be much higher in developed countries, but the loss of life is much, much higher in developing regions. So there is a, a citation there that shows that between 1970 and 2008, over 95% of the deaths related to natural disasters were in developing regions. So this is my science slide <laughs> to show uh, how does climate change actually affect extreme, extreme events? So from a scientific perspective, there is a very clear relationship. And from the very first IPCC report, the connections were being made. So the first factor is that uh, warmer air can hold more water vapor. It also stores more energy. And this results in things like heavier rainfall, which we're seeing, stronger winds, and bigger storms. The second factor, which is a little bit more complex, is that as the temperatures increase, the large scale circulation patterns can be affected. So these are things like the El Nino cycles, as well as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. A recent, I think within the IPCC report, there was a study that was cited that said that um, with even 1.5 degrees of warming, we can expect the El Nino events to double, I think it was, in frequency. Yep, double. <laughs> so we'll see them twice as much. And this has effects on things like temperature, precipitation patterns, sea surface temperatures. And the third fact, which is also very important, is that we know that sea level is rising. Global sea level is rising, and several areas are more susceptible because relative sea level is rising at an even greater rate in those regions. And when you have a higher sea level, you have the potential for greater storm surge flooding. So the graph I have here is from Halifax, which is a coastal city in Nova Scotia in Canada. And what this shows essentially is that with about 40 centimeters of sea level rise, which is what is projected for Halifax by 2050, we can expect an event which now has a return period of 50 years, so it's expected about once every 50 years, to occur about once every two years. So it's quite substantial. 
Okay, so now I'm going to get into my three examples. The first one are heat waves with climate change. Um, it's a very, very strong confidence, strong relationship between increased temperatures and heat waves. And what we can expect to see are longer and hotter heat waves. The graph here just shows the relationship in terms of, if you look at the, um, the curve, as you increase the average temperature, you increase the amount of time that you're in curves, so you'll have more hot weather and more extreme hot weather. Heat well eaves have uh, broad reaching impacts, I'm sure we're all aware of them, very strong effects on health, economic effects, social effects, as well as environmental. Under the climate change projections, we can expect the number of days each year in many regions to increase substantially. I do have a number here from Toronto, which is our most populated city in Canada. So right now, Toronto experiences about 12 days of extreme heat each year. By 2080, the projections suggest about 55 days. Um, that's scary for us in Canada, but many regions, even in the States especially, are expecting substantially more. Where, um, Studies have suggested that large areas could experience more than 100 days of extreme heat each year by 2050, which is sooner than, <laughs> sooner than it seems. And just this final point is that uh, there are deaths even in developing or in developed countries, sorry, associated with heat waves. And this citation I have here is from the 2012 summer heat wave in the U.S., which caused 123 direct deaths. So that's not accounting for the indirect deaths as well. So my next example are hurricanes. So what we expect with hurricanes is that they will become stronger, so more category four, category five storms, as well as wetter. And we seem to be seeing that. It's, it's hard to say exactly, but the trends that we've seen over the last few years suggest that this is already happening. The graph here is just showing the relationship between something called the power dissipation index of hurricanes. But basically that's a factor that just accounts for the hurricane strength the duration and the frequency. And what you see here is the relationship between those factors and the sea surface temperature, which has increased a lot. <laughs> One, uh, I think it actually 90% of the energy has been absorbed by the oceans. So the oceans are very much absorbing the heat from the atmosphere. The way in which it's linked to climate change is that the warmer waters fuel the hurricane, act fuel the hurricane activity the warmer atmosphere, as I said, allows more moisture to be evaporated and more rain to fall. And then the third factor, as I discussed in the first slide, is uh, the sea level rise. It increases the risk of coastal flooding and the risk of the height, sorry, of the storm surge. And really, during a hurricane event, your greatest risk to coastal communities and infrastructure are those storm surge floodings that happen. I've lost my notes, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, let's keep going. So forest fires are extremely important in Canada. Our forest fire seasons, as Ambassador Fuller mentioned, are getting longer. We're seeing longer fire seasons. They're starting earlier, and they're increasing in intensity. And this is interesting. The Fort McMurray fire, which happened in Alberta in 2016, was actually the costliest disaster in our disaster database on record. Forest fires are related to climate change because what we have is more dry fuel to burn during a fire, more frequent lightning strikes that start the fires, as well as dry, windy weather that fans the flames. And there has been a lot of work on this in Canada, with one study suggesting that uh, the fire management costs will increase up to 120% by 2100 in Canada. Thanks. <laughs> So I put this slide in because this is a really interesting area of new research. It's something that 10, 15 years ago was barely mentioned. The advances in basically computer modeling have made it so that researchers can now, almost immediately after an extreme event, do the calculations to find out how much anthropogenic climate change, so that's the amount of climate change caused by our emissions and activities, affect either the likelihood of that event occurring or the magnitude of that event. And I've included a few examples here from the many studies that have been studied. So they have concluded that climate change tripled the likelihood of the severe drought that was in Cape Town over recent years. It increased the amount of rainfall 
from Hurricane Harvey by at least 15%, with some studies estimating up to 40%, and more than doubled the likelihood of the 2018 heat wave. The graph that I have here is a compilation of 170 studies that looked at 190 extreme events, and from all of these, they found that about two-thirds of them were either made more likely or more severe by human-induced climate change. And just to put this in context, in terms of the amount of climate change we've seen, it's less than one degree so far. We're at about 0 0.8, I think maybe 0 0.87. So if we're seeing this relationship at that level, 1.5 is almost, you know, it's close to double that, and then up to two degrees and plus. So this, I would say, is definitely an area to watch and um, very interesting because there are very strong implications for planning in terms of extreme events, preparedness, and perhaps most interestingly, liability. If we can prove that these events were caused by our activities, what does that mean for liability? This is interesting. So I pulled this slide together basically as a summary slide to look at the different types of extreme events. And I just a small disclaimer that the estimate of confidence evidence is my own. So do not cite this <laughs> as a fact, but this was based on my reading. I've read the IPCC reports, I follow the literature. So basically, um, we have very, very strong evidence and strong confidence that we're going to have more frequent and severe heat waves and a greater risk of coastal flooding from extreme sea levels. In terms of heavy precipitation, wildfires, the confidence is strong. There is a lot of research out there to see uh, more frequent and intense precipitation events. We've seen them already. Longer fire seasons, increased fire frequency and severity. And then in terms of the hurricanes, floods and droughts, it's not so much that we don't have confidence, it's that the relationships are more complex and more science is needed to advance that. Then I put the final one here because uh, in, <laughs> mostly uh, in Ottawa, actually, just recently, we had six tornadoes touch down in the space of a few hours, which made many people ask, are these related to climate change? And while you know the theoretical relationship makes sense, there isn't the scientific evidence for that yet, which is why I only have one star for that point. Uh, one more. Thank you. So this is my slide of hope. <laughs> so there are fortunately many, many things we can do to reduce the risk. And as I said, we need to be doing these things now. This is not something that we need to keep talking about and not acting on. The first thing here is we really, really need to reduce the rate of change. Many reasons for this. One, it's directly related to the amount of impacts, which you, Patricia will probably touch on. But this is one uh, fact I pulled out of the IPCC report. So even comparing a 1.5 degree C warming to a 2 degree C, we have around 420 million fewer people being frequently exposed to extreme heat waves. And there's more facts. And the other important point is we cannot adapt indefinitely. There are limits to adaptation. So adaptation is necessary. We need to adapt now, but we cannot put all our eggs in that basket. There will be a point at which we can no longer adapt to the changes that we're seeing. That's my first. And the second is to reduce our exposure. This is something that's event specific. So these are things like protecting our houses and infrastructure against the high winds from hurricanes, protecting against flooding, doing things like providing access to cooling centers during heat waves, planning fire smart landscapes so that the fires that happen don't impact our communities to the same degree, as well as strengthening early warning systems. And I will just do a quick story on that one as well, though I suspect I'm running out of time. When we did have those hurricane, uh, sorry, tornadoes in Ottawa recently, there were several people that said that they received that text message on their phone minutes before the tornado happened. They went to their basement and their houses were leveled. So those early warning systems, if you do them right, they work, they protect people. And the third point I have here is that we do need to increase our capacity to adapt. This is at all levels. Some examples, you need to know where your vulnerable areas and populations are and enhance their capacity through very targeted programs, provide social programs as needed, insurance, build strong institutions, and finally, understand the risks. If you understand the risks, you're better positioned to adapt. 
So just in summary, and I'll just read these quickly. So extreme events are affected by climate change and they are generally being amplified. The observed trends that we're seeing indicate that many types of events have already increased in intensity and frequency. The projections indicate that these will continue in the future. There are rapid advances being made in attribution science Reducing the risks is needed now and requires a combination of both adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Warren. I think no matter where one lives in this hemisphere, whether it's in the north or the center or, or the deep south in South America, I think we're all witnessing more frequent, as you've pointed out, uh, Ms. Warren, and longer events uh, that are extreme in terms of, of climate. And uh, the reality is that this impacts on all of us, and uh, we need to consider how people adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change. And to bring that uh, fully for discussion this morning, we have Patricia Caporazzo, uh, from uh, Managing Director from Food uh, for Development, who will speak to the impacts on society, health, and economic and humanitarian aspects of climate change. Senora. Hola. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por la introducción. Eh, muchísimas gracias también a la Embajada a Canadá por eh, el liderazgo que está tomando en este eh, importante tema eh, de eh, cambio climático eh, y también a los organizadores de este evento, eh, que definitivamente es sumamente importante. Eh, como una breve introducción eh, de mi experiencia, hace 25 años aproximadamente, no les voy a decir exacto, eh, que trabajo en el área de agribusiness, eh, en el área de seguridad alimenticia, eh, sistemas alimenticios eh, y en desarrollo rural. Eh, cuando me invitaron a dar esta presentación, la verdad que para mí eh, es un honor poder hablar y explicar eh, algunos uh, de los aspectos relacionados con alimentación que pueden provocar el cambio climático. Eh, dejaría, déjenme empezar por hablando un poco de las pérdidas eh, económicas que eh, podemos, uh, que se están estimando como consecuencia de distintos eh, grados de incremento de la temperatura. Eh, pueden ver en el slide que pueden ir desde uh, 8% de incremento en el, pre, en el PBI per cápita, en el caso de 1,5 eh, grados de incremento de temperatura, hasta eh, reducciones del más del 30% del PBI en casos de incremento de 4 grados, o sea, si no hacemos nada. Eh, como lo han dicho los previos expositores, incluso eh, Fiona, eh, tenemos, es sumamente importante actuar ahora. Eh, si en uno de los trabajos publicados por la Universidad de Stanford eh, muestra que esos 0,5 grados de diferencia entre 1,5 a 2, esos 0,5 son sumamente importantes y podrían estar eh, representando el 90% de la población que no tendría eh, más, probabilidades mayores al 75% de tener menos daños económicos si podemos reducir eh, en, en vez de llegar a 2 grados, llegar a 1,5. Eh, si vamos a, a, una, a cosas un poco más pragmáticas, eh, Fiona habló bastante sobre todos los daños de infraestructura eh, y daños, de, perdón, Fiona habló bastante sobre eh, los temas de, de los huracanes y 
eh, de los eventos climáticos extremos. Definitivamente, todos estos eventos producen daños en infraestructura, daños en propiedades. Eh, estos eventos se están viendo cada vez más frecuentemente y todos los estamos eh, sintiendo. Eh, como modo de ejemplo, por ejemplo, eh, de los cinco huracanes, de los últimos cinco huracanes eh, que más eh, costó a Estados Unidos, los tres eh, primeros están, eh, pasaron el año pasado eh, y hubo un costo aproximadamente de 200 mil dólares. Eh, de 200 mil dólares. Eh, tenemos que pensar también en que ah, va a haber pérdidas, por, pérdidas productivas en las actividades diarias. Eh, chicos que van a la escuela que no pueden ir, transportes parados. Eh, eh, hay estadísticas que hablan que cada gra grado eh, de aumento de la temperatura hay una pérdida de productividad en el trabajo de 1 a 3%. Cada grado de aumento, pérdida de productividad de unos 3%, especialmente en trabajadores eh, que trabajan en, en el exterior, por supuesto, sin clima controlado. Eh, otro gran efecto, vamos a ver uh, migraciones masivas, uh, refugiados y migrantes climáticos. Eh, ya hoy en día, eh, en los últimos ocho años, aproximadamente hay eh, 28 millones de desplazados climáticos por año. Eh, so, todos estos efectos eh, tienen definitivamente un costo muy importante. Pero eh, déjenme hablar un poco sobre un tema que es muy personal de cada uno y que es eh, básicamente el efecto que tiene el cambio climático en los sistemas alimenticios. El, los sistemas, la particularidad del sistema, de los sistemas alimenticios, que son, no solo sufren el cambio climático, sino que también lo producen. Eh, eh, 14% de las emisiones de greenhouses, de los, de, de greenhouses eh, están producidas en el sector agrícola. Eh, y aproximadamente esto es a nivel mundial. Por supuesto, cada región tiene eh, distintos porcentajes, pero a nivel mundial eh, 13% es producido en el sector agrícola y eh, alrededor de 11% es como consecuencia de deforestaciones y cambio en el uso de la tierra. Entonces, eh, entre la agricultura y cambio del uso de la tierra que se produce por la agricultura, estaríamos hablando aproximadamente de 23-24% de las emisiones eh, de gases de efecto invernadero. Está ocupando básicamente el segundo lugar eh, dentro de los emitores de gases. Eh, si vamos un poco a, eh, si hablamos un poco más de los impactos en el sistema alimenticio, definitivamente eh, todos asociamos sequías con producción de alimentos o en inundaciones con producción de alimentos. Eh, sequías es algo eh, que se según Fiona también comentó, están siendo cada vez más y más importantes. Pensemos que sin agua no hay producción de alimento. Eh, el 70% del agua que los humanos consumimos, el 70% va a temas de irrigación de alimentos. Si bien nosotros consumimos eh, dos litros de agua por día, algunos un poco más, algunos un poco menos, tenemos que pensar que, eh, por ejemplo, para producir una manzana se necesitan 70 litros de agua. Para producir una hamburguesa se necesitan 2.800 litros de agua. O sea, la cantidad de agua que se necesita para producir alimentos es muy, muy marcada. ¿Y qué es lo que está, qué es lo que está pasando eh, con todas estas sequías? Se está echando mano a las napas freáticas y eh, no se están... 
eh, reabasteciendo con la suficiente rapidez como la que las estamos usando. Por lo tanto, se están agotando. Se piensa que ya muchas de las napas no se pueden considerar recursos renovables porque es una... Es un, Uh, es muy difícil uh, um, re, um, reabastecerlas de agua. Eh, en, si pensamos eh, en un caso acá también en Estados Unidos, en la cuenca del río Colorado, en los últimos ocho años, 58 millones de acres de agua se perdieron. Eh, eso es más o menos uh, el doble que eh, el lago Mead, que es uno de las reservas de aguas de, una, de Estados Unidos. Y esto está pasando no solo aquí en Estados Unidos, está pasando en distintos lugares de América y está pasando en varios lugares del mundo. Eh, Fiona también eh, mencionó el caso de Cape Town eh, este año, que fue sumamente grave y prácticamente casi se quedaron sin agua. Eh, eh, otro, de los, uh, ah, otro de los problemas, bueno, esto es sequías, inundaciones, muchísimas inundaciones también. En Argentina el año pasado hubo como 10 millones de hectáreas inundadas, no solo como, caos, eh, como consecuencia del daño climático, pero sí con una gran eh, influencia definitivamente del daño climático. Y para que tengan una idea, y va, esto va a depender del tipo del suelo, del tipo de clima, de la salinidad, pero algunas de estas hectáreas pueden llegar a, a tardar más de tres años para que puedan ser recuperadas. Por supuesto, esto es variable también, ¿no? Pueden ser tres meses, pero hasta tres y cuatro años eh, también. Eh, todos estos problemas estamos viendo también que hay una reducción en el rendimiento y una reducción en la producción de alimentos. Esto ya se está viendo ahora, son datos muy variables y aparte dependen mucho de la zona en la cual estemos hablando. En general, todas las zonas del trópico tienen mayor eh, incidencia y mayor pérdida. Eh, las zonas templadas un poco menos, eh, pero se estima que eh, en el 2030 o 2050 la tendencia va a ser marcadamente negativa en términos de producción de alimento. Eh, como para que tengamos alguna idea, por ejemplo, en el año 2030, en toda la parte noreste de Brasil, se está estimando que la, que la producción de trigo, la producción de arroz va a bajar un 14%, la producción de maíz un 10%, Uh, en el caso de Centroamérica también se estima que la producción de trigo, la producción de arroz bajaría un 10%, la producción de frijoles un 3-4%. O sea, la producción de alimentos eh, va a ser un problema y además a esto le tenemos que sumar el incremento, por supuesto, de la población y eh, que además en general, um, espe especialmente Asia, está teniendo mayores ingresos, por lo tanto, están consumiendo alimentos de mayor calidad. Eh, si hablamos de incrementos de costo de producción, inmediatamente tenemos que hablar de incrementos de precio. Va a haber una volatilidad en la producción, volatilidad en los eh, en los, en los precios y incremento de precios. Por supuesto, quienes son los que sufren más los incrementos de precio son, eh, y todos estos impactos son las poblaciones y los sectores más vulnerables. Los sectores costeros, los sectores más pobres, eh, los, este, los eh, granjeros, los pequeños agricultores, todos los sectores más vulnerables son los que eh, van a sufrir más eh, todos estos problemas. Eh, recordemos, eh, dijimos que uh, en, los prim en, el primero, en el primer slide eh, que iba a haber eh, una reducción del crecimiento per cápita. Recordemos que hay un efecto y una correlación negativa entre la reducción del crecimiento per cápita y pobreza. Eh, y estamos en riesgo de perder todos los avances que se hicieron en el tema de pobreza en los últimos años si no actuamos uh, rápidamente. Eh, 
incremento de la desigualdad definitivamente es otro de los factores asociados con estos problemas y con eh, pobreza y, eh, y con pobreza. Uh, han otro tema sumamente importante es una reducción de la seguridad alimenticia. En los cuatro pilares se van a ver afectados seguridad alimenticia. Hablamos de disponibilidad un poco cuando estamos hablando de disminución de la producción, eh, pero también… Eh, tenemos que hablar de acceso. Acceso está muy relacionado con precio eh, y cuando hablamos de acceso y precio, tengan en cuenta que, y esto ya se vio en las distintas crisis alimenticias que tuvimos en el 2008, por ejemplo, 2012, que eh, las poblaciones más vulnerables pueden llegar a utilizar entre el 60 y 70, 75% de sus ingresos en comida. Eh, otra vez, esto es un tema eh, muy eh, importante y necesitamos actuar hoy. Eh, y por último, eh, tengamos en cuenta que todo esto tiene un componente de género sumamente importante y eh, realmente agradezco eh, a, a Canadá que está haciendo todos estos esfuerzos y poniendo el énfasis en género porque eh, en general, eh, si bien… En todos los libros se dice que hay que, que hay que hacer algo en género. En general, siempre lo, los capítulos de género están en las últimas partes de los libros y nadie, o de los programas y nadie los llega a leer. Eh, pero pensemos eh, que si pensamos en seguridad alimenticia, las mujeres son las que más susceptibilidad tienen de sufrir inseguridad alimenticia. Y si pensamos también en eh, eventos climáticos extremos, eh, ya eh, en mujeres, niñas y niños, se ha visto que tiene hasta 14 veces más de probabilidades de sufrir severos daños o morir en estos, en estos eh, eventos climáticos eh, extremos. Por lo tanto, creo que eh, hay que ponerle a todos estos estudios una seria perspectiva de género. Y, bueno, muchísimas gracias y creo eh, que es importante actuar y como el, el último reporte del IPCC señaló y todos acá estuvimos señalando, es, es sumamente importante actuar y importante actuar ahora, porque el margen no es muy grande. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Patricia. Creo que ambas presentadoras eh, nos han pintado eh, una perspectiva sobre el cambio climático eh, bastante fuerte en términos eh, no solo del número de eventos eh, y, y lo que está sucediendo, sino el impacto sobre las sociedades, el ser humano. Eh, y para mí, escuchando, eh, una de las cosas eh, sentado aquí en, en el ámbito de la OEA es que esto va a crear más conflicto. Porque si, si, si tenemos problemas alimentándonos, si hay problemas con agua, si los recursos son más escasos, si todo está más caro, más gente está sufriendo, sabemos que eso tiene un impacto en términos de actitudes uh, y eso podría generar mayor conflicto no solo en nuestra región, sino a nivel mundial. Y eso es algo que deberíamos uh, reflexionar mucho eh, como uh, personas que trabajan en el ámbito multilateral de cómo vamos a, a utilizar la institucionalidad que tenemos para manejar estos temas en una forma que pueda resolver y pueda traer una, una conciencia que tenemos que compartir lo que hay en este planeta, porque si no, vamos a quedar todos, como dicen en buen inglés, jodidos. Um, I would like at this point to ask uh, Mr. Cletus Springer, who is the director of the Department of Sustainable Development of the OAS, to join us here at the table. Uh, but I think we do have a couple of moments where it may be possible, if anyone has questions, to direct one or two to the panelists this morning. Um, so please, if you uh, have a question, there is a microphone. So if you could just go to the microphone and pose your question, identify yourself, please, and direct your question to either Fiona or Patricia as you see fit. And I'm the Secretary for the OAS. And my question to 
production systems or water systems um, in order for us to, to mitigate the impact of, of those changes on, on food security. So, Patricia. They are, uh, and they are, um, sigo en español. Eh, eh, hay, definitivamente eh, hay, eh, mucho, hay muchos trabajos y la mayoría de los países están tomando eh, acciones eh, especialmente en el tema de research. Hay mucho más por hacer. Eh, el tema es bastante complejo, sobre todo el tema de la producción de alimentos, eh, porque varían eh, con las distintas situaciones. De hecho, eh, se, está, se piensa que en lo, a corto plazo puede ser especialmente en toda la parte de Canadá, en toda la parte norte, que eh, se va a incrementar un poco la producción de alimentos. El tema es que a largo plazo eh, definitivamente va a decaer. Entonces, el tema se está haciendo bastante research, probablemente se necesita hacer muchísimo más porque el tema en sí es muy complejo y hay muchas variables que están interactuando y que interactúan. Eh, con respecto al tema de qué se hace para eh, adaptar, bueno, los productores se están adaptando, eh, no hay, están usando distintos eh, tipos de semillas, están extendiendo, cambiando sus fechas de siembra y sus fechas de cosecha. Hay una adaptación, pero yo diría una adaptación por default. Eh, se necesita más información, muchos de ellos ni siquiera entienden eh, qué quiere decir óxido nitroso, ni siquiera eh, que una vaca eh, produce metano, por ejemplo. Entonces, eh, de hecho, hay muchísima variabilidad en el tema y en el nivel educativo de los productores, en, no solo en el mundo, no solo particularmente en Latinoamérica, sino en todo el mundo. Entonces, necesitamos muchísima más concientización y educación sobre cuáles son los problemas y cómo podemos mitigar el tema de la emisión de gases que eh, definitivamente la agricultura es uno de los principales actores. Muchas gracias. I think we have one more question. <coughs> yes, Jeanette Trammell with the Department of International Law here at the OAS Secretariat. As a follow-up to the question on research, I'm thinking from a policy perspective, if there are kinds of issues that we might be addressing, I believe that the FAO has encouraged countries to take, to initiate and develop um, policies for food security. And Canada, I know, is working on a food policy uh, as well for Canada. Is this the sort of thing where we can make connections that are so critical in these complex issues in terms of introducing the issues of climate change into food production and food security? Sí, definitivamente. Definitivamente es sumamente importante. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo con su comentario. Y uh, trabajando todos juntos es como vamos a poder... Uh, Sí, no sé si salir del problema, pero vamos a poder mitigar y reducir parte de los problemas que el cambio climático está trayendo y la producción de alimentos está trayendo. One last question, please. Eh, Pablo González con el Departamento de Desarrollo Sostenible. Un, un par de preguntas. Eh, la primera para Patricia, eh, te referiste al, al, al impacto, no solamente al, al impacto del cambio climático en la agricultura, el, y la disponibilidad de alimentos, sino también el impacto de la agricultura en el cambio climático. Eh, la pregunta es específicamente cómo contabilizan en, en estos estudios eh, el, el cambio de uso de la tierra, eh, que provoca obviamente cambios en coeficiente de escorrentía, que implica eso mayores inundaciones, y también el cambio eh, que hemos visto, sobre todo en, en Sudamérica, eh, donde se extendieron, por ejemplo, cultivos de soja en áreas ya secas de por sí, donde entendemos que la sequía no es un fenómeno natural, la sequía es, es producto de la deficiencia de, de agua para un, para, un, para un fin. Entonces, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se contabiliza eso y cómo se desmascara eso, si se quiere, de alguna manera, de lo que es el cambio climático? And, and to Fiona, you, you, you talked about the, the sea level rise, you talked about um, the impact of climate change, especially, particularly in, in, in areas or coastal zone areas. Um, the last census in the United States from 2010 uh, indicates that 40% of the population in this country lives in coastal counties or cities. 
um, that's a, about 10% of the, of the continental uh, territory. What can we do to, to, to draw people away from coastal areas? Uh, what can we do about that? Uh, we we pr pretty much, uh, I'm from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. I, I grew up in the coastal area as well, and probably in an area that was actually uh, taken over the, the river in this case. So what, what is what we can do in terms of um, mitigating that risk, not climate change, but mitigating the risk of disasters in coastal areas? Thank you. Muchas gracias. Patricia, primero eh, Con respecto a cómo se calcula lo que se calcula, por ejemplo, con el tema de cambio de, de tierra, de utilización de la tierra, se calcula a través de deforestaciones, que es uno de los mayores impactos uh, en, la, y la mayor, uh, en, en la producción de dióxido de carbono y la liberación de dióxido de carbono en el ambiente. Eh, con respecto a um, lo que tú comentabas de las, del área sojera en Argentina, eh, se están viendo muchísimas inundaciones últimamente, últimamente no, bueno, en los últimos años en Argentina, eh, y parte de esto es también... Eh, ocasionado por el cambio de uso de la tierra y de pasar de tener pastizales y pastizales naturales a eh, cultivos intensivos de soja, por, por ejemplo. Entonces, esto, los pastizales absorben más agua que la soja, por lo tanto se producen inundaciones, es una de las causas que podrían estar provocando este efecto. Pero hay un cambio de utilización de la tierra, eh, de... Una de las cosas que se están haciendo, especialmente en Argentina también, es eh, contabilizar realmente cuántos, cuáles son estas emisiones. Eh, y se está, a través del INTA, eh, se está tratando ahora de contabilizar eh, y de poner un número real a estas emisiones por los distintos países. Fiona, ¿cómo you get más people to move to Manitoba? <laughs> Thank you. That's a, <laughs> that's a good way of phrasing it. Um, in terms of our coastal areas, I think the number one factor is to help people understand the real risks of living there. Once you've identified the risks, there are different, um, many different ways of adapting. In Canada, we do already have a few examples where a managed retreat has been used, where the community has been presented with the case that the Flooding rates are too high, the coastal erosion rates are too high. It does not make sense to continually rebuild in this location. In areas of Canada, we do have the advantage of land, though, so that is not an option everywhere. There's also many things you can do to reduce the risks of flooding in specific areas. Uh, I think a very promising area in coastal regions is the use of green infrastructure. So instead of putting up a seawall, which could create problems down the line, it um, allows the water to be absorbed, and it's, uh, it's actually an area where we get something called co-benefit. So you get the benefits for both adaptation in terms of reduced flood risk, but also benefits for mitigation. It's a very, uh, very inspiring and interesting area of research, and I think uh, Chris Jennings will be touching on that this hour, later this morning. Uh, finally, there's also, I think, a role for insurance, especially in developed countries. If people continue to rebuild in areas that are continually flooded, does it make sense that their insurance, either private or through public systems, is continually paying for that? So, I mean, it might not convince people from Vancouver to move to Manitoba, but <laughs> maybe we could get them to move uh, inland a little bit. Very good. I'd like to thank both of our presenters for very, very provocative and thoughtful presentations. Creo que nos han pintado uh, un esquema en términos del cambio climático muy preocupante. Eh, se debe tratar como crisis porque creo que ya estamos viviéndola. Uh, y lo que necesitamos es ver cuáles serán los caminos disponibles, digamos, para tanto gobiernos como sociedades en la región eh, para poder avanzar y mitigar en lo posible los uh, impactos negativos. I'd like now to turn the floor over to Mr. Cletus Springer, who, as I mentioned, is the Director of Sustainable Development uh, here at the OAS. And as rapporteur, uh, you, sir, have the responsibility of concluding uh, what you have heard here today and also, perhaps most importantly, giving us some recommendations uh, in terms of future actions in the hemispheric context. 
Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I have to say I don't know what the two naught is going to be elsewhere, but the two naught here today has been uh, magnificent. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think there are three themes that came through the presentations uh, in this panel, as well as in the opening statements by Ambassador Mendez and Ambassador Fuller. Um, the themes that I picked up are themes about reality, the reality of climate change. Climate change is real. The need for us to act urgently. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Um, and, and the types of actions that we might take um, to address some of the more uh, pressing and real threats that climate change poses. Um, in terms of what can be done, we, we, we have some, some very concrete recommendations that came out of um, Ambassador Mendes' um, statement that I'd like to, to pick up on. Um, among other things, he called for sustained investment in vulnerability reduction. He recommended that the root causes of vulnerability um, must be addressed. He uh, emphasized the importance of conflict resolution, conflict management, and that recommendation links very closely with the recommendation that was made by Patricia when she dealt with the uh, impacts of climate change on food production. Um, Ambassador Mendez also called for a holistic approach um, to risk reduction um, that takes account of an integrated um, uh, framework for governance in, 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 our, in, our, in our Americas. Um, Patricia Fuller's um, presentation was, was heartwarming in the sense that uh, it highlighted some of the concrete actions that Canada is taking um, to assist especially the vulnerable countries, vulnerable states in, in the Caribbean and Central America to address climate change. I mean, I want to thank you. Um, thank you, Canada, for, for stepping forward in such a concrete way. Uh, Fiona uh, Warren's presentation um, was, was frightening in some respects. Um, it, it pointed out that uh, heat waves and hurricanes and wildfires are, are on the increase. Um, extreme events are increasing. She referenced events over the past um, few years in Canada, um, including increasing global trends and natural disasters. El Nino to double in frequency with a 1.5 degree uh, rise, longer hotter heat waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, importantly, she and this has been a, a an area of debate, and I imagine it will, that debate will continue for many years. Uh, she pointed to advances in attribution. A lot of people have been making a point. Okay, so uh, we have an increase in extreme events. What's the link between that and global warming? And, and that, I think, is very important, that the science of attribution is starting to, to take hold. And, and uh, we can now look, and, and I hope the insurance industry um, takes account of the science on that as well, because they're the ones who have been uh, pushing back on loss and damage uh, debates in the COPs um, over the last few years. What can be done um, from Patricia, uh, sorry, from Fiona, uh, reduce the rate of change in, in, in global warming uh, and climate change. Reduce exposure, uh, event-specific exposure. And, um, invest in early warning systems. Uh, these early warning systems, she pointed out, they work uh, if they're well designed and well implemented. Increase the, the capacity of those in vulnerable communities to adapt. Help them to understand the degree of risk that they are taking on when they choose to live in vulnerable uh, areas. In some cases, they have no choice, of course. Uh, in the Caribbean, it is not a case of retreat from coastal zones because the entire Caribbean in some countries is coastal. Uh, so where do you go? You move from the coastal zones to the mountains, you put yourself at risk of, of uh, uh, landslides and landslips and, and all kinds of things. You stay in the, in the valleys, you're exposed to floods uh, and, and so on. So it's not, these are not easy choices that are available to our people. Um, but Secretary Osborne um, raised a very important question, uh, how much research has been done to adapt production systems um, to address climate change? And I think there's a role here for the, for the OES in, in trying to set a, a research agenda, helping our research institutions to set a research agenda around these issues. We have many universities in our, in our Americas who are doing work in these areas, but that work is too loosely um, 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 set up now, and we need to bring it into some sort of coherent 
uh, kind of framework. Um, and, and Jeanette raised the issue of a policy on food security, and Pablo raised the issue of uh, how to bring people uh, out of the coastal areas. So all in all, I think we have some very concrete items that we can move ahead with in terms of concrete recommendations. And I'd like to thank all of the uh, presenters um, in the two sessions uh, for giving us something to work with. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you very much, Mr. Springer, for a very, very thorough report of the morning's proceedings. Uh, es momento de una pequeña pausa de café para todos, para digestionar un poco lo que se ha planteado esta mañana. Tal vez el cafecito nos va a hacer menos nerviosos sobre el tema eh, para las presentaciones que vienen, pero quisiera agradecer tanto a este panel como a, a, los, a los embajadores que abrieron. Creo que estamos de buen camino. Por favor, a las 11 en punto de regreso, 11 en punto, hora canadiense. Así que aquí los esperamos. Gracias. Thank you. Sorry. No, 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 no